Okay, in this uh, second video on the introduction to the GI tract, we're going to look at the gut wall, um, kind of look at its general structure, look at the different components and so forth. And this is going to be applicable for pretty much the whole tube. Um, and then later we're going to look at the, for example, the pharynx and the esophagus, the stomach, small and large intestines all together. Um, and then uh, from there we'll go and look at the anatomy of the blood vessels and the nerves and so forth. So the gut is a continuous tube. It's about nine meters in length, a little bit longer in a cadaver because it's not all puckered up with smooth muscle and whatnot. Um, the mouth is at the proximal end, the anus at the distal end. Uh, majority of it is enclosed in what's called peritoneum. So there's a lining on the outside of the gut and uh, it attaches usually pretty firmly to the outer portion of the gut called the serosa. Um, there are four basic layers, or what are called tunics throughout, really three basic layers and a fourth kind of secondary layer. Uh, and the structure of these layers are going to vary in different regions. Um, so the stomach is going to actually have a little extra muscle than other parts of the uh, intestines. And uh, the way that the inner lining, the mucosa, is folded in the small intestine is very different than other areas of the gut. So this theme is going to be uh, different in each of the organs, but the general idea is going to be the same. So if we look at what those four layers are, the innermost layer is called the mucosa, and that consists of an epithelial layer, um, and the uh, it's going to be made up of several different cells. We'll look at what those going to are here in a bit. Um, the epithelium rests on a little basement membrane that's called the lamina propria, and then there is a very tiny muscle layer called the muscularis. So uh, if we look at this picture up here, the uh, mucosa, the epithelium is in pink here. Uh, lamina propria is actually not just the basement membrane. I should really be clear that it's actually all the connective tissue between the uh, epithelium, including the basement membrane, and this little thin band of muscle called the muscularis mucosa. Muscularis mucosa is going to be able to in different parts of the intestines contract and it actually can pucker the lining to make it fold more, to increase the surface area and so forth on the inside of the intestine. And then notice we have these deep glands which go into the next layer of the uh, intestines called the submucosa. And many of these glands secrete things like mucus or other substances and they come out uh, and they can meet the food and the lumen of the intestine. Um, so if we look at the mucosa in different parts of the GI tract, uh, there's really four different variations. So we have protective mucosa, and that's going to be where the epithelium is made up of what's called stratified squamous epithelium. Remember, squamous is flat epithelium. Uh, stratified means it's in layers. This is very protective uh, and gives uh, sort of a barrier uh, to you know, corrosion and things like that. And that's going to be found in the oral cavity and the pharynx parts of the esophagus, actually all the way down to the junction with the stomach, and then the anal canal are going to be mo made of that stratified squamous epithelium. Um, then there's epithelium uh, mucosa, which is called secretory mucosa, and that contains cells that are uh, responsible for digestion, uh, secretion of digestive enzymes, and that's going to be found in the stomach. So pepsin is going to be an example of one of those enzymes. There's absorptive mucosa, that's going to be mostly in the small intestine, and that contains what are called crypts and villi. So if we're going to look at the mucosa in the small intestine, it actually has these projections called villi, then it has these deep crypts, and then another villus and a deep crypt, and kind of like this. And so the villi are going to be lined with uh, these epithelial cells, and they're called enterocytes in the small intestine. And then deep down here, there are glands that secrete a whole number of things like mucus and different enzymes and so forth. And they're going to all come up in the, and meet the mucus layer out here. Uh, and that's where it's going to meet the food and so forth. So that's going to be a special type of mucosa, absorptive mucosa found in the small intestine. And then large intestine is going to be a little bit different. It has what's called absorptive and protective mucosa. It's going to really specialize more in water absorption and mucus secretion. Uh, so again, not so much absorption of nutrients. So that's the mucosa. Submucosa is going to be the region below that. So if you look at this picture, everything between the muscularis mucosa and this thick red line, which is the muscle layer, everything in white here, that's going to be the submucosa.
and that contains connective tissue which is studded with arteries and veins and lymph and nerves so that's going to be very important there and then there are mu the muscle layer that's the the red zone out here um, and that is usually going to be in most of the intestine two layers one an inner circular layer that kind of is able to constrict so when it contracts it can actually squeeze the intestine at that point another layer which is we have to draw it kind of sideways is if this is the gut tube the muscle fibers are actually arranged parallel to the gut tube and that's called the longitudinal layer so this is the transverse layer this is the longitudinal layer and this allows food to be churned in place as well as propelled down the gut tube for peristalsis now the stomach is interesting because it actually has a third layer um, that is actually a um, so kind of cross hatched so it kind of goes this way and that's going to give even more stronger uh, churning capacity than in for example the small intestine um, and then finally on the very outside we have the adventitia uh, and that's connective tissue and that's where blood vessels and whatnot all come in the nerves and so forth um, in the portions of the GI tract within the peritoneal cavity, so that's most of the abdominal cavity, um, the cirrhosis, the adventition is lined by mesothelium, which is simple squamous cells, and uh, that's part of the peritoneum, and this area is gonna be known as a cirrhosa. So cirrhosis is a special type of adventitia that's covered by mesothelium, which is part of the peritoneum. So those are the four basic uh, layers of the gut, all the way down from the mouth, all the way to the anus. But each different region is going to specialize and have a special type of mucosa and muscularis externa layer and so forth. Okay, let's look at the mucosa in more detail. Again, it's going to differ depending on which layer of the intestine we're talking about. But the uh, first part of mucosa is the cells that line it. So if you look at the picture over here this is actually showing us in small intestine here's the muscularis mucosa down here and here are the cells lining the uh, mucosa on the outside here and um, these are epithelial cells remember epithelium always rests on a basement membrane so underneath here there's a little basement membrane uh, and that's made of connective tissue and different proteins um, and the predominant cell in especially the small intestine this is going to be the absorptive cell would be a simple columnar epithelium and again that's called an enterocyte um, they're also found in the stomach uh, and these are uh, really important for secretion and absorption there are tight junctions between the enterocytes and that's going to be part of what's called the gut mucosal barrier um, and uh, these are the major absorptive cells so if you look at an enterocyte if you look at its surface it's actually folded these are not hairs these are actually folds in the cell membrane and these are called microvilli so microvilli are little folds on the surface of the enterocyte uh, these have to be seen with electron microscope they're too small to see with a typical microscope and uh, they actually are where the brush border enzymes are found so remember those brush border enzymes that are needed to complete the digestive process for uh, disaccharides and uh, dipeptides and so forth they're found on the brush border so what's important about that is that damage to the enterocytes um, and damage to the brush border can cause damage to the ability to, to f digest those nutrients and that can result in malabsorption now what's important is these cells are actually being uh, regenerated very quickly so there are uh, down here in these little crypt like sections there are stem cells and they're going to multiply and as they multiply they move up and they create new mucosa so the mucosa is constantly being shed off uh, and uh, again every 72 hours or so we replace it uh, with that uh, those new stem cells um, now if there's a continued inflammatory process then of course you're going to get the balance so that ultimately you're still going to lose cells and uh, that's what you see like in conditions like celiac disease we actually see in the small intestine a complete flattening out of the villi they disappear and um, so you get a much less surface area for absorption the brush border is destroyed etc um, now again in the mouth the pharynx esophagus and anal canal we have the what are called the non-keratinized stra stratified squamous epithelium keratin is a protein that we find in the skin so we also have stratified squamous epithelium in the skin but it has keratin which creates that really hard barrier 
the squamous epithelium in these other organs is not keratinized. Also mixed in with the epithelium are what are called enteroendocrine cells. Uh, enteroendocrine cells are, um, there are several different types, but they secrete uh, peptides, and these are now known as gut hormones. Um, so a uh, very specific type of cell, for example, secretes serotonin. So you've probably heard the idea that the gut secretes more serotonin than the brain. That's true. Secretes more than 99% of your serotonin. Um, and that's secreted by from these enterochromaffin cells. And these cells are all wired up to the nervous system in the gut. So we can think of little nerve projections coming in, and they're going to go out to these little cells, and they're going to stimulate them. Um, there Another cell would be the goblet cells, and um, they secrete mucus. So these are very important. They actually synthesize mucus, which really is made of proteins that are joined together by disulfide bonds, uh, and they absorb water. Uh, so mucus is mostly protein with water, um, and uh, this is going to form what's called the mucus barrier on the inner lining of the gut. So I guess I could draw in a little marker here. It's going to be a barrier here. And uh, it's actually you have two layers to it. Uh, actually, you can see that down in this picture a little more clearly in blue. That's the mucus lining. But that's all going to be secreted by the goblet cells. Notice that, um, interestingly, the mucus barrier actually has two layers. So there's an inner mucus layer. Um, and then there's an outer mucus layer. Uh, most of your gut bacteria are going to be found in the outer layer. Um, and in fact, if they are able to cross that inner layer, that's when we start having pathology. Notice here the uh, uh, tight junctions that are found between the enterocytes that are actually preventing any antigens or anything from leaking in between the cells. Uh, if those uh, junctions are intact, all nutrients should pass through the enterocyte, and then they actually go through the opposite end, the basal end of the enterocyte, basal lateral end, and they're going to be absorbed into lymph or blood vessels in the uh, uh, on the other side here. Um, but if we have a breakdown of those junctions, then nutrients, uh, potentially peptides and antigens can leak in through that space and go directly into the blood without being properly processed here by the enterocytes. Another and very important mucosal cell is known as a paneth cell. And uh, these often get overlooked, but paneth cells are very important. So again, they're gonna be found, in fact, I think if we look at this picture, you probably have a panet cell in here, yeah. So it's in the orange uh, panet cell here, and they're down at the bottom of one of these little, these are called the crypts in the small intestine. Um, so they're going to secrete a number of different antimicrobial peptides. Um, so alpha defensins are a big one, lysozyme, and so forth. And these are going to actually prevent bacteria, uh, even normal gut bacteria, from crossing from the outer to the inner mucus layer. So they're gonna put their peptides into the mucus layer and that's gonna create a boundary defense here uh, between the two mucus layers. And so that's very important when we have overgrowth of bacteria, often there's a problem with the panda cells. Now, panda cells are um, technically immune cells, part of the uh, innate immune system, um, but they are gonna be influenced again by those nerves that come in. So Again, we're seeing this sort of which comes first, the bacterial overgrowth, or is it really a breakdown of the panda cells, the nerve activity in the gut, and so forth. Um, there are also special cells in the mucosa called microfold cells, and that is, or M cells, and that's shown here. Here's a microfold cell in purple, and these are actually antigen presenting cells. So they actually take antigens from different bacteria, whatnot. They're going to bring them in and present them to uh, macrophages in lymph nodes um, or in what's called the pyrus patches in different parts of the intestine. So we'll look at that here next. But um, that's uh, going to be immune antigen presenting cell and M cell. And then I mentioned the stem cells, which are down in the base of the crypts that are constantly regenerating many of these cells. Um, there's also in the lamina propria, that's the area between the muscularis mucosa and the uh, epithelium. This is areolar connective tissue. It has lots of capillaries and lymphatic vessels, and that's where all those nutrients that are absorbed are gonna go into those capillaries or lymphatics. And they're gonna pass the nutrients either to the liver, or in the case of lymphatics, to the circulatory system. Um, there's a little bit of a, a, a lymphatic tissue here. This is called the MALT, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. It's present all along the GI tract, 
very rich in the tonsils, the small intestine, the appendix. We think one of the main roles of the appendix is uh, immune. It's a lymph organ, lymph node, um, and large intestine. And uh, these are nodules of lymphatic tissue, and they're filled with lymphocytes and macrophages. Many of them are antigen presenting. So they get, um, for example, antigens from the uh, microfold cells, and they pass them on and um, prime them. And they are going to also protect the GI wall from bacterial overgrowth. Uh, then finally, the muscularis mucosa, that thin little layer, that's going to help create more surface area and whatnot um, if necessary. So those are the three layers of the mucosa. The next layer will be the submucosa, and that's going to contain lymph vessels, larger blood vessels. These would be arterioles um, and venules. Uh, so a bit of interstitial fluid and then various glands. Um, there's a special type of lymphatic tissue associated with the submucosa, and that's called the GALT, the gut-associated lymphatic tissue. You can say it's a special type of malt or subdivision of malt. Um, it, uh, it's composed, again, of concentrations of lymphoid tissue with T and B cells and antigen-presenting cells, so they can get primed up to different antigens if necessary. These cells also secrete secretory IgA and secretory IgA forms, it's going to be secreted into the mucus layer, and that's going to form what's called the immune paint on the inner lining of the gut wall, and that's going to again have a, a, an effect of controlling different uh, bacteria and so forth on the gut wall. We find in chronic stress states, high cortisol states and whatnot, that the secretory IgA level really goes down, and people are much more susceptible to gut infections. Um, so there's a special type of galt in the small intestine, mostly down in the distal small intestine, called the Peyer's patches. And you probably heard of these, but these are look like giant lymphatic aggregates. So here we have this, this light purple area is the submucosa here. Um, so everything between, this is the muscle layer on the outside, here's the mucosa. So the lighter area is the submucosa, and then you have these giant lymphatic aggregates piled up there, those are the Peyer's patches. And so they're gonna do everything I just talked about. They're gonna get information from those microfold cells. They're gonna get antigens presented to them. They can uh, rev up an immune response if necessary and so forth. So that is the GALT. Um, and uh, once, interestingly, the, for example, T cells, if they are presented with antigen and they get stimulated, they're gonna migrate out uh, through little lymphatics into what are called the mesenteric lymph nodes and that's where the immune response will be amplified. And then that can actually, the, some of those antigens can now go to the spleen and other places. Um, here is um, the picture of some of the mesenteric lymph nodes around the large intestine. This is important because this is another way that solid cancers, adenocarcinomas, travel. So colon cancer can metastasize through these lymph nodes. And uh, so in uh, surgical, uh, resection of tumors, they often have to go in and cut out many of these lymph nodes as well. Now, a very important structure in the submucosa is called the Meissner's plexus. This is part of the nervous system of the gut. And the Meissner's plexus really, uh, or submucosal plexus, is, uh, contains the cell bodies of nerves and um, little groupings of those cell bodies called ganglia, which are going to pass nerve information down to the muscularis mucosa and to the actual uh, epithelium. So this is really the relay station for information going out to the uh, mucosa and coming back in, like sensory neurons. So that's the Meissner's plexus. Now the Meissner's will also get uh, input from the outside, from the sympathetics and the parasympathetics, and that's going to tell it to do different things. So again, we're finding that chronic stress states, high sympathetic tone, it actually causes the Meissner's plexus to send out information that basically weakens the immune defenses, the microfold cells and the PANA cells and all that at the mucosal layer. Similarly, in parasympathetic states, the opposite happens. Um, so very important for regulation of peristalsis and secretion of gut hormones. So that's gonna be our first, there's gonna be another nerve plexus, but that's the first one. And you can kind of see um, in this picture to the right, um, the uh, submucosal plexus um, so it's kind of buried down here. So you can see in the yellow, these are all the nerve ganglia, and it's like laying right up against the mucosa. Here is that second nerve plexus called the myenteric plexus. That's actually going to be found in the next layer, the muscle layer, between the transverse, uh, the circular, I'm sorry, 
and the longitudinal layers of smooth muscles. So that's going to be our second plexus, and that's going to control the muscle contractions more. But submucosal is going to control the activities at the mucosal layer. So then we come to the muscularis external layer. That's our next layer, and that's going to be mostly smooth muscle. So again, an inner uh, circular layer, uh, and then an outer longitudinal layer. Uh, so the circular layer helps to churn food in place, and the longitudinal layer will actually help propel the food down the gut tube and uh, for peristalsis. Uh, again, the stomach has a third layer called the transverse. I think I misspoke earlier. I, I called the circ circular transverse. It's actually transverse, meaning that it kind of goes cross-hatched, um, and uh, that's going to be in the stomach lining. But you can see in this picture here we have the mucosa with the villi in the small intestine with the crypts in the villi. Here we have the submucosa, and then here we have the muscle layer. So we have the circular layer, which is on the inside, and the longitudinal layer, which is on the outside. Now sandwiched between those two layers is the hour box or myenteric plexus. And this is the second little nerve brain I talked about. Um, and that is going to basically innervate the smooth muscle and regulate peristalsis. Uh, this too has input from the sympathetics and parasympathetics. And basically sympathetics will stop the gut peristalsis, parasympathetics promote it. So that's pretty dramatic. When people are in stress states, their intestinal peristalsis literally stops. Um, and uh, so that's always important to consider there. Now, another reason I keep emphasizing the nervous system is, again, I connected it here with the chi a little uh, while back. Um, it's also something that I should just make a footnote here and say that we are more and more finding that acupuncture is a direct way of influencing the autonomics in any organ, including the gut. So we have a tool through acupuncture to directly regulate the autonomics. Herbs do that as well, but more of the long term. Uh, but acupuncture can have a more immediate effect there. Um, finally, wrapped around the um, uh, whole intestine is a serosa. And again, um, that's really technically the adventitia. It's going to be serosa if we have the peritoneal mesothelial tissue attached to it as well. Um, it actually secretes a lubricating fluid. Um, and uh, this will be important for helping the gut sort of churn and, and whatnot. Now notice that most of the gut, and this is from the embryologic development, is really uh, hanging in the peritoneal space. So if we look at these blow up here, of the small intestine wall, we uh, can see the three the layers of the intestine there, and the muscle layer and so forth. Um, and then we have this what's called mesentery, which is connected tissue. It's part of the peritoneum, which is wrapped around the gut, but it holds it like a sling. And uh, basically from that sling come your major arteries going into the gut, your veins, and that's gonna all collect again into the portal vein, and then your lymphatics and all of your nerves as well. Um, so the sling kind of contains all that. So if you kind of, you can actually take all the guts out uh, of the abdominal cavity. They're all it's connected by these, these little, uh, you know, slings to the body itself, to the body wall, and, um, and that's where it's getting all its nutrition. And in fact, uh, in major abdominal surgeries, when they sometimes have to do fully remove the intestines to find, for example, intestinal blockage or obstruction, uh, they just got to take the intestines out, they find the obstruction, uh, maybe uh, resect that part of the intestine, or uh, maybe cut any scar tissue away that might be causing that, and they just pack back in, just push in all the intestines, and they find their way back into where they need to go. So that is the um, kind of mesentery and how the gut is related to that. Let's look at that concept of mesentery in a little bit more detail. So the peritoneum is really the, this giant serous membrane. It's the largest in the body. And if you do a cross section here of uh, the abdomen, here we have the spine. Oops. Here we have the spine. Um, here is one of those little slings holding the intestine I talked about. Um, so here we have the aorta, a little artery comes out through that sling to the intestinal wall, veins come back this way, um, and then um, we have the peritoneum really lining this whole cavity. So we have one layer of peritoneum here, and another layer right up against the intestinal wall, and then we have basically just empty space here. Um, now of course this is all filled with intestines, so it's not quite that empty, um, but um, the, that's kind of the general structure there. So the parietal peritoneum is what lines the uh, abdominal wall, and the visceral peritoneum is what's right up against the organ. 
And again, both of these secrete a lubricating fluid, so it's very moist in here. Uh, it keeps everything sliding appropriately. So the peritoneal cavity is the space, again, between those two cavities, the, those two layers. It's gonna contain that lubricating serous fluid. Um, that can actually accumulate fluid in different disease conditions, one in particular being something called ascites. In ascites, this is most commonly caused by liver failure. The liver, uh, two things happen. One, the pressure in the portal vein backs up, so all the fluid backs up. Um, and uh, the liver also fails to synthesize adequate albumin. Albumin is a plasma protein which stays inside of blood vessels. So we have albumin in here, and there's only a little bit of albumin out here. So as a result, via osmosis, it's gonna actually pull water from outside back into blood vessels. So albumin is actually one of your major proteins for regulating the blood volume in the body. Now, if the liver fails to synthesize enough albumin, uh, what ends up happening is, um, if you get very low albumin, you get more albumin on the outside of cells, now the fluid's gonna leak out and so basically from the portal vein, uh, as well as from the arteries and whatnot, fluid's gonna leak out and accumulate in the peritoneal space. And you'll get this giant distended belly that's all filled with fluid. You actually see this also in a condition known as kwashiorkor, which is protein malnutrition. When children, for example, are starving, they don't eat enough protein, they get these big swollen bellies, and that's all fluid from ascites that builds up there. So that builds up in the peritoneal cavity. Um, now, some organs, notice, are behind this. So if we look at the kidneys, for instance, um, they are actually behind the peritoneal cavity, so they're back here. Um, and uh, we call those retroperitoneal. So uh, uh, the kidneys, the ascending and descending colon, interestingly, are also uh, retroperitoneal. So is the duodenum of the small intestine and the pancreas. So all those organs are outside the peritoneal sac, a little bit different. Now the peritoneum is highly folded, kind of weaves between the viscera, and the folds again contain those major blood vessels, lymphatics, and nerves. Um, and there are five major folds. So one big one you've probably heard about is the greater omentum. Kind of hangs like a drape off of the uh, stomach, but the greater omentum is important because it actually contains fat, adipose tissue, and this is what's called visceral fat right up against the organs. It's underneath the uh, muscle layer of the abdominal wall. And so really when we look at the abdominal wall, we can have two different types of fat. Visceral is deep, part of the omentum, for example. Um, the liver also in, in obesity becomes enlarged with fat. Um, so does the pancreas to some degree. Uh, and the spleen, interestingly. But these uh, organs all fill up with fat and uh, that pushes the belly out Interestingly, the uh, subcutaneous fat, which is what's on top of the muscles, can be pretty thin. So people can have, you know, you can still see the muscle there, but it's all the fat underneath. And we now have good data that that type of fat, the visceral fat, is far more atherogenic. It's associated with cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, and uh, really is associated with negative outcomes with all sorts of those conditions. Uh, so that's the dangerous fat versus subcutaneous fat, what's on the hips or the outside of the muscles. We don't think uh, metabolically it's as dangerous. Uh, this type of fat is very pro-inflammatory, which is what contributes to the problem. Uh, there's also other ligaments, the, the lesser omentum. Uh, it actually suspends the stomach and duodenum from the liver. And this actually contains some structures like the hepatic portal vein, um, the common hepatic artery, which is the major arterial blood supply to the liver, and the bile duct that I talked about earlier. There's the falciform ligament, mesocolon, and then the mesentery, which really binds the jejunum and ileum to the posterior abdominal wall. Now this has fat, but also it's connective tissue. So many people are talking about the mesentery now as the hidden organ, or the organ that's been under our eyes the whole time, we just didn't think about. Um, and that's true, but the mesentery is highly innervated with nerves, with other things. So you can say that all these different systems interweave there. So that's a little bit about the peritoneum. So finally, let's look at some of the general structures like artery and arteries and veins and nerves that um, interact with the intestines and the gastrointestinal system. So the celiac artery, remember the foregut, midgut, hindgut, each have their own arterial supply coming off the aorta. So the big one, the celiac artery here, is what supplies blood to the liver, the stomach, the uh, esophagus that's part of the abdominal cavity underneath the, uh, uh, the diaphragm. Uh, 
the spleen and the superior half of the duodenum and the pancreas. And you can see the celiac artery and all its branches right here. So there's a little branch called the celiac trunk and then all these other arteries uh, come off of it and supply the different organs. The superior mesenteric artery supplies blood to the inferior half of the duodenum, all the jejunum and ileum, two thirds of the transverse colon. Remember transverse colon, so we have our small intestines, they, go, they drain into the cecum, and here's the appendix. Here is the ascending colon, then it goes across, it's cut away in this picture, and then it descends, it's also cut away here, and goes into the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then here is the uh, rectum and then the anus. Um, so the uh, superior mesenteric artery supplies blood all the way to about the distal uh, one third of the transverse colon. And then the inferior mesenteric artery takes over and supplies all the rest. So these are the three main blood supplies to different parts of the intestine. Notice that there are a lot of these little loops, uh, which is important um, in the small intestine. So, these arterial, these are called the arcades, and they actually uh, allow for greater blood flow to the intestinal wall. And that also allows for, if there's any, for example, obstruction or blockage, that part of the wall can get blood from other places. That said, you can unfortunately get what's called thrombosis, um, which is arterial thrombosis. You can get an obstruction of the blood, and that can create ischemia to part of the bowel, and that part of the bowel can die. Um, so that's more of a medical emergency kind of thing, um, but that's an uh, unfortunate thing that can happen there. Another problem that can happen is in the inguinal canal, part of the intestine can slide down, get trapped, for example, in a male on the scrotum, get twisted, and that twists the blood supply, and then that area becomes uh, uh, infarcted. And infarct means death of cells because of lack of circulation, and then it dies. Uh, it can become gangrenous. Um, okay, so those are the three main arterial supplies. Um, the venous supply, again, the majority of the gut drains into the portal vein, and that all goes back to the liver. It breaks into a left and right branch in the liver, and so forth. And again, I'll just emphasize, when we talk anatomically about left and right, we mean the patient's left and right, or the, the subject's left and right. So left, liver, left side of the body, actually, um, so if we talk about the... Um, left spleen or left liver, it's more to your, what would be left in you or right in you, not looking at the patient, not their left and right. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so that's the portal vein. Notice that the spleen also drains into the portal vein. So does the pancreas. Uh, that'll be important because the pancreas secretes a number of different hormones like insulin. And um, all of that insulin goes straight to the liver first before it goes to the rest of the body, interestingly. And then the gut has rich lymphatics. We've already talked about the pyrus patches, the galt and the malt, the mesenteric lymph nodes. They all drain into what's called the cisterna chile, and that goes up through the diaphragm into the mediastinum, becomes the thoracic duct, and that drains into the left subclavian artery and then enters the right atrium in the heart. So again, large fatty acids are actually absorbed right into the lymphatic system. They go straight to the heart first in circulation before going to the liver. Um, okay, um, let's see, yeah, okay, so that is the uh, major arterial supply. Now, again, correlating this, this with Chinese medicine, the arterial supply brings the oxygen and nutrients, able to fire up the mitochondria and so forth. This is what's going to create tissue warmth and tissue activity, and we call this the yang. Very interesting, we're finding that some, especially with aging, the arterial supply to different organs starts to decrease for a number of different reasons. First, the little arterioles become stiff, that's called arterial sclerosis. They can get plaques, that's called atherosclerosis. Uh, but basically, because of that, uh, the metabolism can decrease. And especially in digestion, people get less blood to the stomach wall, they get less stomach enzyme secretion, less acid, etc. So we're finding that a number of herbs, actually, the bitters, for example, actually activate the blood flow to the gut wall and they can activate the metabolism and we call that the yang aspect again excess would be more heat and that's actually correlated often with too much blood flow to the blood wall and so forth so the arterial supply here is much going to be much more related to the uh, warming aspect of metabolism interestingly the venous supply would be more the draining away of blood clearing heat 
Um, and uh, so we can think of that as more cool, even yin-like. So arteries, veins, we can think of as the primary yang and yin polarity. So we already went through this, but again, the GI tract has really two sets of nerves. There are nerves intrinsic to the GI wall, just to review, that's the enteric nervous system, and then nerves extrinsic to the wall, that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic parts of the uh, autonomic system. And the nerve activity to the gut really regulates peristalsis, uh, the secretion, the gut immune activity, and sensory activity. And so more and more, we're finding that there's a communication between the gut and the brain. We're calling this the gut-brain microbiome access. So the bacteria often participate in this. They secrete signals that are sensed by the gut wall, works into the, the submucosal plexus, the myenteric plexus, and then the uh, vagus carries that information back to the brain. Then we have information from the brain going back out to the gut, which regulates activity. Um, so that is the um, gut-brain axis. Um, the enteric nervous system, again, is being called the second brain or the brain of the gut. There's about 100 million neurons and extends from the esophagus to the anus. And they're very complex GI reflex pathways, again, regulating the motility, the secretion, immune and sensory activity. Um, there are many different neurotransmitters in the gut, but serotonin is probably the biggest one. So we know that when serotonin is active, it stimulates peristalsis, stimulates all that activity. Um, but we've also found that GABA and glutamate, GABA is the major calming neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Glutamate's the major stimulatory neurotransmitter. Dopamine. Um, for example, Parkinson's, we have some interesting data now that it could actually begin in the gut. The different bacteria and, and the different inflammatory processes are actually conveyed to the brain via the vagus nerve. Especially misfolded proteins are actually transported by the nerve into the brain. And we know that in Parkinson's that results in loss of dopamine secreting neurons in a very specific part of the midbrain. And that's what results in the movement problems and whatnot. Um, we uh, know also that in Parkinson's that uh, one very common uh, complication is chronic constipation. And uh, we think it's the same involving the same loss of dopaminergic neurons in the uh, large intestine as we find in the central nervous system. Um, so they parallel each other. Um, again, the enteric nervous system has two subbrains, the uh, submucosal plexus, Meissner's plexus, and then the myenteric or Auerbach's plexus, and they each are regulating different parts of the gut. So if we look at this in more detail, here's the different layers of the gut. Here is the longitudinal muscle, circular muscle. Here's the myenteric plexus. So you see, for example, parasympathetic nerves coming in. They primarily secrete acetylcholine as their main neurotransmitter. And then a nerve here, this is the cell body of the nerve, and this is this axon, projects down. Once it's activated, it secretes acetylcholine down here in the submucosal plexus. And that then maybe goes out to the gut wall and has an influence on the pan cells or some other cell there. Um, here we see another parasympathetic fiber going straight down, synapsing into the submucosal plexus, and then uh, synapsing onto the mucosa directly. Um, we also have sympathetics that come down, and they can come down and, uh, for example, they secrete norepinephrine, and that can counteract the activity of acetylcholine and so forth. So you see these very complex regulatory cycles. We also can see here how uh, I think in red, they're actually depicting serotonin secretion on some of these. Um, we have serotonin also is a neurotransmitter. That's 5-HTP, or 5-HT is serotonin. So very complex signaling pathways going on here in the gut. But uh, again, we're finding that this is directly implicated in a lot of gut disorders. Now, the autonomic nervous system is complicated. Um, we, again, have the parasympathetic sympathetic divisions. Parasympathetics are coming primarily from the vagus nerve, that's cranial nerve number 10, which has its origin in the brainstem. And then it sends two nerves on either side of the body down, and that innervates as it goes down through the chest, through the diaphragm, into the organs that's gonna innervate your lungs, your heart, uh, all your intestinal organs, again, down to the distal one-third of the large intestine. And then there's some sacral nerves that also come out forming what's called the pelvic plexus, and that's going to innervate the rest of the large intestine, your bladder, 
the reproductive organs and so forth. So that's the parasympathetics. And again, parasympathetic is going to be using acetylcholine as its primary neurotransmitter. And that's the so-called rest and digest response. So it's gonna stimulate secretion, saliva, and so forth. If there's too much of that, in fact, that happens in conditions like irritable bowel syndrome, then people get overactive bowels, diarrhea, all this kind of thing, too much peristalsis. And then drugs can actually be used to block the acetylcholine to turn that down. Um, the opposite is the fight or flight response. This one's more complicated. The nerve endings all come out of the thoracic spine or the upper two lumbar segments of the spine. They project either onto a little ganglia here. A ganglia is a grouping of cell bodies, uh, not too far of this on either side of the spine. This is called the sympathetic chain. You can see this on you know, cadavers or looking at the back. You can see the two chains on either side of the spinal cord. And then uh, what's called a postganglionic neuron comes out and then will go to a target organ, like the lungs or the heart uh, and the intestines. Now there's another interesting pathway and that is the nerves will come out, they'll go right through the sympathetic chain and they'll synapse onto what's called the prevertebral ganglia and then go out, send a projection out to a target organ. So there's one major prevertebral ganglia actually in the solar plexus around that celiac um, artery and uh, the nerves will actually follow all the arteries into the organs. So you see an interesting connection between arteries and sympathetic nerves. Um, again, these are related more to high oxygen, like consciousness activities, fight or flight, versus the uh, parasympathetics don't necessarily follow that same schemata. They, have, they work through the vagus and the sacral nerves here. So that's just a little bit on the autonomics in case that's new to you. Again, in the case of parasympathetics, acetylcholine is the major neurotransmitter. And then there are what are called muscarinic or M receptors on the individual organs. And in general, parasympathetic stimulation increases gut motility and, um, and increases immune activity and so forth. And there's a very important sensory role. 80% of the vagal fibers are sensory. Um, the sympathetics arise from all the thoracic or the upper lumbar segments of the spinal cord. And uh, these secrete norepinephrine as their major neurotransmitter at the organs. And they're gonna bind onto what's called adrenergic receptors. And there's two major classes, alpha and beta, and I'm not gonna go into that yet. We're gonna talk about that much later. Uh, there's actually subclasses of each of these. So for example, there are beta one receptors on the lung, on the heart, beta two receptors on the lungs. If you stimulate beta one receptors, that's gonna increase heart rate, the contraction of the heart muscle. If you stimulate beta-2s, that actually dilates airways. In fact, medications like albuterol um, and all those asthma medications, uh, those uh, bronchodilators work by stimulating beta-2. They're beta-2 agonists uh, versus we have a class of medications for people with too fast of a heart rate uh, and so forth, and those are called beta blockers. They actually block uh, uh, the beta-1 receptors, sometimes the beta-2s, which is an unwanted side effect. Um, anyway, so it gives you an idea of the receptors there. In general, uh, sympathetic stimulation on the gut decreases GI secretion and motility. It inhibits the activity. Uh, in the salivary glands, for example, parasympathetics increase thin, watery saliva. Sympathetics decrease saliva, makes it more thick and gooey and gummy. Uh, and so just changing your autonomic tone can change your saliva. Uh, and this is closely connected again with anger and fear and different emotions. Now in Chinese medicine, I've made the point already that we can connect the autonomic nerve activity and the enteric nerve activity to this concept of digestive qi. Uh, so uh, digestive qi excess would be increased parasympathetic tone with cramping and constriction. Deficiency would be decreased tone. We see that, for example, with increased stress, increased sympathetic tone. Uh, but then you might have less secretions of saliva, but also stomach acid, pancreatic enzymes. You won't fully break your foods down and so forth. And again, we can use potentially acupuncture as a tool to modulate the autonomic system. Now, there are a group of hormones secreted by the gut. In fact, these are now being called the gastrointestinal git hormones. Um, and they're secreted by the enteroendocrine cells in the small intestine stomach, pancreas, those are the three primary organs. We actually know the liver now secretes hormones. Uh, so it's very interesting. And these control various GI functions, but many of the hormones in very small amounts get into the blood and have effects on the brain. Uh, 
on, for example, satiety or uh, general metabolism and things like that. Um, and uh, so there's a lot to discuss, and I'm not going to be able to go through all of them here, but I'll just mention some of the big players. Um, gastrin is a very important one, and we'll see in the stomach. Uh, that's secreted by what are called G cells in the stomach, and that's going to stimulate gastric acid secretion. It also proliferates gastric epithelium. Um, and this is released usually when you eat foods containing amino acids or proteins. Ghrelin is secreted by the stomach, and this one actually is a hunger hormone. So when your stomach starts churning and you start feeling hungry, that's because ghrelin is being released into the blood, and that's interacting with your brain, your hypothalamus, and that turns on your feeding center. Um, cholecystokinin is another big one. This is CCK. This is secreted by cells in the duodenum and the jejunum. They're called eye cells, and they're going to be uh, secreted when we eat fat or some amino acids. Um, and they're going to stimulate really the release of pancreatic enzymes, but it's also going to have a major effect on contracting and emptying the gallbladder and increasing the bile activity. It gets into the blood and actually increases satiety. So it tells the brain, okay, you don't need to eat as much. We have enough nutrition going on here. Um, so that's cholecystokinin. Secretin is secreted by the small intestine cells. They're called S cells in the duodenum and the jejunum. And this is going to stimulate secretion of water and bicarbonate from the pancreas and the bile ducts. Um, usually it's the acid from the stomach hitting the duodenum which triggers the release of secretin because bicarbonate is very neutral, or basic, I'm sorry. So it's going to neutralize the acid in the small intestine. So that's how the pancreatic juice actually neutralizes stomach acid. Those pancreatic enzymes will not work. Uh, enzymes from the pancreatic juice won't work unless it's a very basic medium in the duodenum. Motilin is another small intestine hormone, and that increases GI motility. So there is what's called the, we'll talk about this in depth with the small intestine, something called the migrating motor complex, which triggers the motor activity in the myenteric plexus. And they, it happens at different cycles and waves. And so the myenteric plexus um, is going to be activated by the parasympathetics, by thyroid hormone, but also by motilin. Now, a couple of interesting ones in the case of when we talk about diabetes will be GLP-1. Uh, GLP-1 is secreted by the L cells in the small intestine, and it is what's called an incretin. It means that it's going to actually get into the blood and cause the pancreas to secrete more insulin. And that's why eating food with glucose will stimulate lots of insulin into the blood, versus if you intravenously inject that glucose, it actually doesn't cause much of an insulin release, and that's because of GLP-1. And so now there are a bunch of drugs on the market actually to mimic GLP-1. And uh, they actually stimulate the pancreas to release more insulin in type 2 diabetes. Um, so that's GLP-1. And then GIP is similar. It, uh, it's going to inhibit gastric secretion motility, kind of slows down the emptying of the stomach into the small intestine. And it's going to potentiate the release of insulin. Uh, we currently don't have any GIP agonists on the market, but uh, that's maybe coming. Um, so how does all this relate to Chinese medicine? Again, we could think of hormones as part of the digestive blood aspect, the nutritive aspect that's involved with signaling, but it has a regulatory effect on nutrition metabolism. And so we can see blood deficiency, blood excess patterns uh, related potentially to those, uh, those gastrointestinal hormones. Now the final concept I'm going to talk about here is the gastrointestinal mucosal barrier. Um, and that's the property of this intestinal mucosa that really ensures that the bacteria that are naturally found in the gut are contained. Now a couple things, most of the gut bacteria is in the large intestine. As you get closer up to the stomach, go up to the small intestine, it becomes more and more sterile. In fact, it's the stomach acid in the stomach that prevents most gut bacteria from growing. There's one exception, and that's called Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori. That can grow in the stomach acid-rich environment. But most of the other bugs uh, are actually more concentrated towards the large intestine. But they're found in this mucus layer, and especially in that outer mucus layer that I talked about. So the mucosal barrier basically is what prevents anything that we don't want from getting in. So it's going to include the mucus, mucus barrier. But it's also going to include the intestinal epithelium, the tight junctions we had talked about, and the microbiota itself. So we have beneficial bacteria that make an environment unfriendly for other bacteria and keeps them from growing. 
Um, of course, break down those tight junctions, that's what leads to what we're calling leaky gut. Um, chemical barriers like bile and gastric acid actually are antiseptic. Um, and they prevent different bacteria from growing. I mentioned the pan cells with defensins and lysozyme. Um, and then antimicrobial peptides called AMPs are also secreted. All these create an environment inhospitable for potentially pathogenic bacteria. And then the secretory IgA we talked about, and then cellular immunity, all this would be part of a deeper immune barrier. Um, so we find that the intestinal barrier dysfunction where we have a breakdown of that barrier, is implicated in a lot of things like food allergies, infection, IBS, inflammatory bowel diseases, IBD, celiac, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, septic shock, potentially SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and potentially autoimmune disease. So we're finding the gut mucosal barrier is critical to maintaining normal immune homeostasis. Now, when it comes to the gut flora, um, again, most of them are in the colon. Uh, there's about 10 times more bacteria in the body than cells. Uh, and the estimate is that gut flora have about 100 times as many genes as our genome. Um, it's sort of a forgotten organ. And again, it's an aspect of that gut-brain microbiome access we discussed. Uh, if you just take fecal dry weight, about 60% of it is uh, the mass is made of the bacteria uh, in your feces. Uh, there's between 300 and 1,000 species that live in the gut. Uh, most come from about 30 to 40 species, and uh, most of them are anaerobes, meaning that um, they can't grow. Uh, they actually grow in an uh, oxygen-poor environment, which makes sense, being in the gut. Uh, most are found in the colon, and they decrease. The counts go less and less as you go further up towards the stomach. Um, and um, again, we're thinking there's a symbiotic Healthful, healthy, beneficial relationship that we have with these uh, flora. We can actually think of the microbiome as being part of our life activity. It's really the seed of our uh, basic life activity in the body. Um, we acquire the gut flora as infants. So in a um, normal fetus is born with actually a sterile gut, the gut tube is sterile. And with vaginal delivery, the first bacterial spores and whatnot are introduced uh, from the mother. Um, in the C-section pa uh, babies, that's going to happen later, and that seeding is from the environment. And so we're going to get so somewhat different microbiome populations as a result of that. Um, we also see a difference in breast versus bottle-fed babies in terms of their flora. And uh, usually by the second year of life, though, there's a pretty stable flora that's been established. Again, uh, things like antibiotics and whatnot could change that, but that's going to be the typical case. Some of the common flora would be things like bifidobacteria, bacteroides, clostridium, uh, ruminococcus, enterococci, and then lactobacillus. Uh, and there's actually importantly some important fungi which we think are actually beneficial, commensal. So even in low levels, things like candida and especially saccharomyces, uh, we think are actually beneficial fungi which are part of this microbiome. Um, the functions really are to complete carbohydrate fermentation and absorption. Um, and this is what creates gas. So gas from the intestines is usually from uh, hydrogen or carbon dioxide or methane. Sometimes it's gonna be from hydrogen sulfide, which has a very smelly, sulfury smell. Um, and we call that flatus, that's the gas. And um, the bacteria actually can uh, take carbohydrates and turn them into short chain fatty acids. And uh, short-chain fatty acids are kind of the preferred food source for colonic epithelium. So that actually works to give nourishment to the colonic epithelium. Now, if you have very poor upper GI digestion, your pancreas didn't secrete enough amylase, you didn't break those carbohydrates down enough, then your intestinal flora will do that for you. And that could result in more gas and, and so forth. So that's something to think about when uh, talking about treatment. Uh, the intestinal flora can also work with proteins. It breaks down any remaining undigested proteins. Unfortunately, it can break them down into amino acids like indole and scatol, hydrogen sulfide, fatty acids. These are, uh, indole and scatol have potential, potential uh, toxic effects. And uh, so we can talk about, they actually contribute to the color and mostly the odor of the stool. Um, and uh, they can actually be absorbed into the portal vein. Uh, where usually the liver then has to convert them into non-toxic substances. Uh, 
but that can overburden the liver. And so this is what the old naturopaths used to call auto-intoxication. That's why they would often put people on protein poor diets um, and do bowel cleanses and all this kind of thing, thinking that uh, many of these compounds are building up in the body, uh, creating problems. Kind of interesting today, we've swung the other way. We have now have the ketogenic diets, high protein, high fat. But you know, it's interesting, it'd be interesting to see what kind of metabolites that's creating from the intestinal flora. Um, the flora also convert bilirubin, which is a pigment in bile, uh, to simpler pigments like stericobilin, and that contributes to the color of stool, the brown color. They also synthesize several vitamins, uh, B vitamins, biotin, B12. Some vegetarians actually can get enough B12 from their gut bacteria that they don't have to take extra. Um, but uh, interestingly, that's hard to predict, and everyone's going to have a different microbiome, so uh, that's something we can't always depend on. And vitamin K as well uh, is synthesized by the gut bacteria. And uh, again, they're involved in immunity, so this idea that the immune system begins in the gut is very true. Uh, again, we already saw that with all of the immune organs, the malt and the galt, the mesenteric lymph nodes, uh, and that... Now we have the gut bacteria, which are helpful for developing oral tolerance to uh, antigens and so forth. So we can think of this mucousy phlegm protective microbiome layer as a yin uh, aspect uh, in Chinese medicine. So this is an aspect of digestive yin. So uh, yin deficiency would be a lack of the proper flora, lack of mucus, um, maybe overgrowth of pathogenic flora. And then yin excess would be more of dysbiosis, again, overgrowth, too much mucus, and so forth. So that's a little overview of the microbiome. There's a lot of interest in that now and how it shapes the organs and how there's this commensal relationship back and forth. However, I do want to stress that the nervous activity, the blood flow activity, the hormones are all very important for regulating the microbiome itself. And so the relationship between the microbiome and us is really twofold. It's a two-way street, um, and we have to always make sure we keep that in mind. So that's it for the summary, the introduction to the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, next, we'll jump into the individual uh, GI organs.